get started. Um, so welcome to today's uh, webinar. Let's do a quick sound check to make sure everybody can hear me. Please chat, type into the chat box with a yes or a Y uh, so that we know you can uh, hear us. I'll give a, a few seconds just for uh, more people to enter the room. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, please note that today's uh, presentation is being recorded. Um, please type any questions uh, into the chat box in the Q&A function uh, on Zoom and we'll get them uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, before, we, um, ask, before I ask the speakers to introduce themselves, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to AgeWell because not everybody who's on the uh, webinar is going to uh, be familiar with AgeWell. So AgeWell is um, Canada's technology and aging network. We're a federally funded uh, organization um, and our vision is Canada's uh, leadership in technology and aging benefits the world. Um, AgeWell's mission is to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners and future leaders. And our goal of this community is to accelerate the delivery of technology-based solutions that make uh, a meaningful difference to the lives of older adults in Canada and worldwide. So just a few highlights about uh, AgeWell. Um, uh, we have over 250 researchers from across Canada in 43 universities and, and research centers in eight provinces. Um, AgeWell is always, uh, has always been very much about partnership and we now have 50 startups and a community of over 4,900 engaged older adults and caregivers. Um, also, AgeWell is very much focused on delivering real world solutions. And I think this is the main focus of our um, presentation today in the book that, we've, um, uh, that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so in terms of real world solutions, AgeWell uh, over the last five years has produced 118 um, different types of uh, products. And by products, we include things like policies, practices and services as well as the more academic publications. Um, and that's what we're actually gonna be talking about today, which is the new book that AgeWell has produced. Um, so be before I go on to talk about this, I would like to wish everybody happy International Women's Day. 70% um, of the book's authors identify themselves as women. So that's 47 out of 69 author contributions in total. And two of them are the editors we have with us today. Uh, the book also includes contributions from many members uh, and is a major output from our network. Also during the webinar today, uh, all attendees will have a chance to win one of three hard copy, uh, hardcover copies of, uh, of our book, Knowledge, Innovation and Impact. Um, so uh, we have uh, eligibility is everybody online today, uh, participants that tweet age well, uh, uh, NCE, uh, and include a highlight from the webinar or a quote that resonated with you in the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, before we go on, I'd like the, um, uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Judith May and Alex, just to very briefly introduce themselves. Oh, by the way, I'm Andrew Sixsmith and I'm Scientific Director of, uh, of AgeWell. I should have said that right at the start. So May, do you want to... Uh... Sure thing, and sorry if my internet cuts in and out. Um, I'm here joining you from, from Scotland and sometimes our internet cuts out. But yes, hi everyone. So my name is May and I'm an, I am a, an assistant professor in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Dundee. My background is in public health and I used to be uh, or still 
part of AgeWell um, as an affiliate HQP alumni. Um, my research really focuses on understanding digital places and spaces. So thinking about this idea of aging in place, but within a digital context. And I do have a lot of interest in, for example, integrating also critical social theory into um, this notion of technology design for older people. My methods that I'm really keen to use are very community engaged and community focused. So I am really interested in co-design methods and co-design initiatives. So the section that I'm going to focus on today is about how we can design together. Thanks very much. Thanks, May. Judith? Hello everyone, I'm also um, sitting here in Dundee in Scotland. My name is uh, Judith Sixsmith and I'm a professor of health research in the School of uh, Health Sciences at the University of Dundee. Um, I'm a psychologist by background and um, but much of my uh, research work has been on um, trying to figure out what we can do to, um, to ensure that older people live healthy um, and active lives. So um, in terms of my affiliations, I was uh, a member of AgeWell and took part in several projects within AgeWell and co-led uh, on the transdisciplinary working um, um, cross-cutting theme, uh, promoting transdisciplinarity um, throughout the AgeWell network and all the work we do and how we interact with each other as well. And um, basically now a lot of my search is based around uh, placemaking with older people, particularly looking at uh, how we develop age-friendly uh, communities and cities, um, taking on uh, the perspectives of older people and taking into account intergenerational relationships along the way as well. And the other side of my research is about um, palliative and end-of-life care and looking at how we can best provide uh, palliative and end-of-life care, particularly for people who are living in their own homes and in the community, and particularly as they're aging in more perhaps disadvantaged uh, contexts. So that's me. Thanks, Judith. Uh, Alex? Hi, everyone. Alex Mealides. I'm a scientific director and CEO of AgeWell. I'm also a professor at University of Toronto, where I focus on uh, technologies for older adults, uh, primarily with cognitive impairments such as dementia, using various things such as artificial intelligence, sensors, um, and other things uh, uh, related to this area, with a keen interest also on uh, product development and commercialization. So. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned before, I'm Andrew Sixsmith. I'm a co-scientific director of AgeWell. Um, I'm also a professor of gerontology at Simon Fraser University. Okay, um, so let's go on to talk about the book. Um, so um, why have we put a lot of effort within AgeWell to, uh, produce, uh, to, to produce this book? Um, uh, one of the things that this visual shows is a, it's a picture of older adults, stakeholders and researchers working together. And I think increasingly in the, in the research world that we, uh, that we live in, there's a big push towards engaged research where uh, researchers uh, work with stakeholders um, and, their, uh, and, and communities uh, to develop knowledge and to put that knowledge into practice in terms of new policies, new solutions, new technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're all aware of, uh, of, of this kind of, um, of, of, of approach. However, this image is, is great, but in practice, um, this process of engagement is not straightforward. And over the last five years, of experience that AgeWell has had is we've identified a number of areas and that's what we're gonna talk about today where we think the research community probably needs 
um, a little bit of a helping hand in terms of thinking around some of the problems that are involved in engaged research, um, and also some of the, um, the, the ways forward in, in, doing, in doing that. And typically people have experience in some areas, uh, but in other areas, maybe less experience, less knowledge. So this book is meant to be a kind of a preliminary go-to in all these uh, different areas of engaged research. So our aim has been to provide a straightforward and accessible guide for carrying out research that will help researchers to turn good science into real world impact. Um, too often researchers excel at research design, data collection analysis, but often um, lack the knowledge and ability to take that knowledge forward uh, to commercialize or mobilize the outcomes of, of the research. So this book is about providing the practical advice um, in some key areas uh, that are central to Agewell's way of working. Um, so that is around transdisciplinary team working, co-creation and uh, knowledge mobilization. And that's uh, what we're primarily gonna be talking about uh, later in the uh, presentation uh, today. Um, in practical terms, the book contains very uh, straightforward chapters, uh, how, which we call how-to chapters that provide guides on specific topics such as team working in research projects, commercialization, and effective communication, and also includes a lot of case studies and, uh, and worked examples. So it's very much a practical guide to engage uh, to engaged um, research. Uh, there are four sections to the book. Um, thinking about impact, which I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more. What do we mean by innovation? Uh, so it's useful to define a few principles. Um, a second section of the book is about working collaboratively, focusing on working on, uh, on transdisciplinary working and integrated knowledge mobilization, and that's what Judith is going to be talking about. Um, a third section, which is designing together, uh, which is focusing on co-creation uh, approaches and stakeholder engaged research. And then a fourth section, which is about creating research products, which uh, so, sorry, the third section May is going to be talking about, and then the fourth section, creating research products, uh, Alex is going to be talking about, and that focuses on the practicalities and challenges of knowledge mobilization. So just to start off uh, by grounding everything in a few basic ideas. Um, so when we think about impact, so the whole idea of age well, and why we've written this book is really to uh, look at this relationship between research and impact. Uh, so if we start to think about impact, there's no real well accepted definition of innovation. Um, um, I think in very general sense, um, you know, quite often we think about innovation being around an invention such as a new, developing a new technology, but Innovation doesn't necessarily mean developing a new thing in itself. It might be about introducing a new process or, um, or actually changing the way that we do things. And I think a very, very broad definition of innovation could be about doing something in a new way that will have some kind of positive benefit. Um, I think the other thing to remember about innovation is that it has to be implemented and used by people, businesses, etc. So innovation is very much about people. And, uh, and I think that's at the core of Agewell's way of doing things. Um, it, it, uh, innovation really focuses on uh, how new technologies, new products, et cetera, are gonna be implemented and used by people in real life situations. We should also be aware that innovation is not just about technology, it's not just about devices um, and, um, and systems, et cetera, et cetera. Although Agewell is very much focused on the development of new technologies, um, innovation could also be about a new process, a new service, a new policy, or a new business model that is going to implement that, uh, that technology. 
And that innovation could look very different uh, across different sectors. We also should be aware that innovation doesn't always look the same. It's possible to define in very broad terms, three types of, of, um, of, of, of innovation. Um, incremental innovation refers to doing things, uh, or small changes in the way that we do things, which, um, which, which improve um, um, a business process or the care that we provide or improve a service. Um, but we should also be aware that there are also disruptive and radical innovations. And these are things where we, we do things in very different ways. Um, I was think, trying to think about a good example, and a really good example of the differences between uh, incremental innovation and these more significant innova uh, innovations is um, say um, the way that telephones have have um, evolved and, and innovated over the years. Uh, telephones were invented in the 19th century and basically the technology was pretty much the same based on analog technology until the 1990s. And it was only with the advent of digital um, communications that the kinds of, um, of uh, communications that we're now very much used to in the 21st century uh, became possible uh, with the use of um, with the use of digital communications, and this has allowed us to do a lot more in terms of um, the things that we now take for granted. For example, um, digital streaming on TVs, smartphones, um, etc., etc. So, however, we do have to remember that incremental innovation, the small things it probably represents the biggest uh, way that we can do things differently. We also should be aware that there are different types of research products. So for example, technology, uh, these are products and include systems and devices that are directly uh, uh, used to support the health of patients and consumers. But there are other different types of products as well. Uh, for example, uh, services. These are the way we help people or organizations, for example, a mobility service or financial advice. Innovation could also be in terms of policy and practices. These include policy briefs, guidelines, models of good practices um, that politicians can use to make decisions and changes in the public sector and benefit the community. And also knowledge in a very general sense. This is the information that a person or organization could use to facilitate change such as information on healthy living. Um, within the innovation world, we also quite often think about what might be called the innovation pipeline. So many of the people on the, um, on the webinar today may be familiar with the, something called the technology readiness level scale. Uh, so this is well used within the, um, within the innovation uh, world and really highlights the, the kind of um, the state, the various stages uh, from basic technology research through to implementation. So the TRL scale has these nine stages. I'm not gonna go into them in detail. What we've done in the book is to create a, a simpler model, which is called the product innovation pathway model. And we use this just to simplify things to make it clearer um, level one, talks about innovative ideas. Level two is about planning and uh, developing a research project. Um, level three is about the development of the solution itself. Level four, testing and evaluation, showing evidence that this, is, this uh, new product is gonna have value. And then level five is about actually getting, getting it out into the real world in terms of outcomes and impact. Uh, one of the innovations within the, the book itself is that, um, that each of the chapters, each of the how-to chapters has this product innovation pathway model um, at, at the end, which suggests the kinds of activities that one should be doing in, um, in a particular area uh, at these different stages of a, uh, of a project.
And just a, a, a very simple example of this before I go on. Um, this is a, um, an example of, of, of a product that I was involved in uh, developing um, uh, a few years ago, which, is called, which was a simple music player uh, to help people with dementia access music. Um, this was aimed at improving the quality of life of older people. Um, and just to kind of fit it in with this idea of the product innovation pipeline, we put a lot of effort very much early on in the project, looking at developing ideas about what uh, quality of life was about, what uh, kind of new products and services might be useful to people with dementia to improve quality of life, rather than focus on many of the problems that older adults with dementia have to live with, focusing more on, uh, well, how can we enhance people's enjoyment um, and, and experience in, uh, in, in life. And one of the key things that came up from speaking very closely with older adults and caregivers was just how music was, uh, was valued uh, by, uh, by uh, older adults with dementia and how music was something that seemed to be um, something they could appreciate even as communication problems or uh, confusion um, became uh, more apparent. Um, we took these ideas through the various stages in the product innovation pipeline. I can't go to, into it in too much detail. I can provide people with uh, some literature if they're interested. Uh, but what we were able to do by very much focusing on thinking about the innovation process right at the start, I think we were able to design a product which was going to be practical and usable within a very um, within the context of living with dementia that, uh, that allowed people to use it. We're also very much aware of the issues around commercialization uh, from the very start uh, and made sure that our ideas were going to be feasible uh, in a real world, uh, uh, real world context when it came to uh, commercializing the device and, um, and actually marketing it. Um, we typically see innovation uh, as being quite a long process from ideas through to implementation. Uh, there's a kind of a rule of thumb that 17 years is the, is the, the kind of uh, length of time that it takes from an initial idea being developed through to its uh, implementation and commercialization and it become an, becoming uh, widely available uh, within the uh, community. Uh, we actually did this uh, project and had the device commercialized within about a seven to eight year time frame. So uh, having uh, a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about uh, during the presentation today in mind as we go on, uh, I think is very important for the acceleration of the research into the innovation process. Okay, I'm now going to hand on to Judith, who's going to be talking about working collaboratively. Okay, thank you, um, Andrew. Um, so, um, in this second section of the book, what we wanted to really highlight is that, you know, when we start thinking about research, we really do concentrate on putting the re research proposal together and conducting our research studies to make sure they're rigorous and follow you know, all of the um, research processes um, in our design to make sure our methods are appropriate and our data generation and analysis is um, spot on and so on. But actually, one of the ideas in this book is that it's just as important to have a strong focus uh, placed on working collaborati collaboratively because research projects are about often are about teams of people working together. And I think, Andrew, you said it earlier about um, how such work is about people and relationships and teams. And so um, and this part of the book focuses on working uh, collaboratively and how we can work best in in teams and across disciplines and across sectors to make sure that all the partners in a pro project are listened to, 
that they're contributing to a research study, whether they're less experienced in research or are renowned academics perhaps, or experiential or sectoral stakeholders. If we're working together in a project, everybody's voice needs to be equally um, listened to. And so in the project, we can think about building inclusive research uh, cultures where it's easy to speak out, where our relationships are open, where we know each other as much as people and in our relationships with each other as we do about our academic ac expertise. And that, um, and, and to think about how can we work effectively um, with those stakeholders across disciplines and across sectors, so that really bringing the beneficiaries uh, of our research into our work and co-creating uh, that work with us. <clears throat> so how do we think as well, if we're going to really concentrate on teamwork, how do we begin that notion of respecting each other, of respecting uh, teamwork? So this first um, slide on teamwork and research cultures starts off, and, I'm, and, and I do apologize because the first bullet, bullet point should be forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. So I got the first two um, stages uh, the wrong way around. But this is uh, developed from um, an old, uh, um, model in 1965 about how do you build a team and what should we be attending to at each stage of that team. So it's uh, by Tuckman in 1965. Uh, where forming is about where we start to work and to learn about each other in our research project. And it's often quite a positive and exciting stage. And, and, and we tend to think, oh, this research is going to be great and it's going to do you know, great things. And we begin to set clear objectives um, to, and, and, and we can start to work on those relationships that we need to achieve the objectives that, um, that, that we've set. So forming that teamwork is uh, a really important stage. And at that stage, we really do need to think about each other and what our expertise is and how we can bring our expertise together in the most effective way. Um, the next stage is uh, storming, and that's quite often where maybe the, the honeymoon phase is over and we're starting to push the boundaries of our ideas, challenging each other and the way we think and our attitudes towards perhaps the topic uh, of concern. And it's often where uh, conflicts arise. So that people can um, kind of start to fail to get on with each other and, to feel, and, and so working effectively together can be a little bit compromised. And so I think that's important um, to, to, to acknowledge as a normal part of uh, teamwork um, in research and that perhaps we shouldn't be frightened of it as such, but, all, but that we should be um, observing and identifying when it's happening so we can put in place um, the appropriate communication um, strategies um, to deal with uh, our communications with each other, our conflicts, and to understand um, who's making the decisions about what and agreeing those decisions. And that can all be uh, part of this, uh, the notion of uh, developing a terms of reference document, which outlines um, what's happening and how it happens uh, in, in our team. And, uh, and for me and in our book, we do advocate that ev every partner in that project uh, needs to be part of the uh, forming of that um, terms of uh, reference document. The next stage in Tuckman's model is about uh, norming and it's focusing on resolving those differences, appreciating, it, appreciating each other's um, strengths and weaknesses and respecting uh, the leadership and the forms of leadership that uh, we're invoking in that uh, project. So, um, 
it tends to be a stage where we come together more, perhaps commit to uh, the research and the project and to each other. And again, I'm going to emphasize that working in teams, it's about relationships and it's about people and it's about working together as much as it is about um, developing the research project and the topic in the topic um, itself. So trying to bond um, together. And there you can think, uh, Andrew, could you go back please um, there you could think about um you know in terms of bonding looking at how we can reduce power inequalities within the team how we can build rapport and quite often in the work we've done a focus on each other as social beings the development of friendships and again you know thinking about how do we address and address any uh, conflicts is really important and finally, thinking about that uh, research culture, if we do all of that, if we really focus on the team, then we're thinking about um, how do we build a positive uh, research culture where it's as important to celebrate our successes as it is to deal with the problems that arise. So, um, so thinking about um, such a model as uh, Tuckman presents us here, it's not one dimensional. We, we tend to go through this in different stages back, back and forth um, in our research. And why I brought that model up and, it, and why it's featured in, in this book is to say that really, if we're gonna work collaboratively together, we need to have a way of thinking about uh, what are the stages of our teamwork and how do we identify and deal with issues as they come across. And that fits really well with uh, transdisciplinary working um, because transdisciplinary working, again, is very much about developing together with our partners, with our stakeholders, with, with our researchers at whatever level um, of experience they are. They're developing together a shared vision, shared aims and objectives um, for, our, for our projects so that we, we're not all working on different aspects of the project, but we're all working towards a common good in our project to focus on wicked problems. Now, transdisciplinary work, working focuses on those really complex, in some ways quite intransigent social problems that have failed to be resolved in working in any other way uh, towards their resolution, taking very much a real world focus so that we embrace complexity um, in the real world rather than reducing the complexity of the problem so that we can see it more clearly we need to really think about in transdisciplinary working, embracing that complexity and bringing together and integrating our knowledge from different uh, disciplines, from different sectors, and, um, and, and, and clearly um, ensuring that the beneficiaries of our research, such as uh, in this case, um, all the people um, would be, uh, are part of our project, are partners in our project, and not just onlookers to it or information providers uh, in it. And I think that in terms of trying to build some innovative new models, some new ideas about how we address that complex problem, then we need to look very carefully at ourselves and, and, and to be reflexive about how we um, how we frame our problem and um, how we deal with each other and what we can learn from each other. So transdisciplinary working is really very clearly about uh, working together in a mutual learning and reflexive uh, stance. Um, finally, I think um, I wanted to say it's transdisciplinary working is very much action oriented because it's not just about producing knowledge, but it's about producing knowledge that can be translated and, and mobilized uh, into the real world in order to implement solutions. And the good measure of a transdisciplinary project is not that it's achieved its objectives as a research project or a development project, not just that a technology has been produced, but that that technology is out in the real world and is making a positive difference to the lives of people who are um, using it. 
Next Judith, slide. Sorry, Judith. Um, I'm going to have to cut you short there because we need to go on to uh, May's presentation now. But I think that that's a really good summary of of transdisciplinary uh, work. Okay, fine. Um, okay. Just to say that, um, you know, there's very many uh, how to pages in this book, and there's very many um, different practical uh, advice on how to do transdisciplinary uh, working and how to build teamwork. So please do look further in the book to see um, what we've got to say about helping you to uh, work effectively in teams. Thanks. Thanks, Judith. Okay, May, over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. So um, my section in the book as an editor is really about how we can design together. So that actually builds on um, Judith's, you know, section about how we can work collaboratively together. And in thinking about this, Andrew, did you want me to move, shift the slides? Okay, thanks very much. And just thinking about the ways in which practical ways of how we can design together. Now, it's really interesting because the vision for research has really progressed from working in silos towards open scholarship and knowledge co-production. So different theories and ways of working have really um, supported the ways in which we can engage the general public in research and research governance. So, as Judith has highlighted, there are more equitable ways of involving people from research, from policy, from industry, um, from the lay community, for example. And But why is this important? I think it's important because we need to find ways in which we can all share accountability so people as people who create knowledge and as people who seek to benefit from it. So what better way than to find um, really useful methods to engage people of different backgrounds and sectors to work together. And this way of working can help to ensure that our social and economic benefits are seen in real world contexts. Next slide, please. So this section of designing together has three key ideas. The first one is about meaningful engagement of non-academic stakeholders throughout the entire research process. And I remember being a part of AgeWell, we talk about transdisciplinary working quite a bit, but there was also the question of, so how do we do this? What are some practical ways we can do this? And actually this section has outlined the different phases of research and some ways that we can then work um, with different stakeholder groups. So usually when you're thinking of conducting reviews, um, people perceive this or researchers perceive this as, you know, a, a process where it involves perhaps one or two people, but actually you can involve, for example, a, a steering group to help shape the entire literature review process. And there are different types of reviews which, which can help support this. Now, phase two of the research, we're really thinking about what types of methods we can use that is helpful for engaging different stakeholder groups. So we have Astel and Fells talk a little bit about that in their chapter. Now, phase three is really about putting together, you know, the ethics applications, having um, some discussions about ethical considerations. So we have some authors, again, from AgeWell, who really have put in some really interesting chapters on, you know, thinking about the principles of bioethics and also thinking about how we're all sort of responsible for doing research in an ethical way. Now phase four is really thinking about how we can actually engage people, how we can engage them when um, producing ideas, turning them into products and also prototyping. So we've got Piper Jackson, Amy Huang, Southwick and colleagues 
who have contributed chapters there. Now, phase five thinks really highlights the ways in which we can work in cross cultural ways. So that's something that I, I feel like is um, often overlooked um, in when we're in the entire, when we're engaging with research. And I think um, Mortison and colleagues really make some good recommendations on how we can maintain good relationships uh, with people from different cultural groups throughout the entire research process. And finally, phase six, again, another sort of aspect or phase of research that often takes place in another project um, and not fully included, I think, when we're trying to conduct research, possibly for structural, uh, because of structural limitations, funding, um, timeline limitations, et cetera. But Park, Lester and colleagues from UBC really highlight a project um, in which, you know, to highlight the, the importance of evaluating health technology, um, this chapter really highlights and emphasizes metrics for usability, clinical effectiveness, efficiency, cost, safety, and sustainability. Next slide, please, Andrew. Now, the second key idea is about mechanisms to enable joint working with non-academic stakeholders. So again, I've highlighted that steering groups is one way to inform, um, for example, the evidence review process, but there are also different creative ways in which we can, you know, not only engage stakeholders from different backgrounds and different skills, but also engaged in more, um, for example, research informed teaching. So I've used personas, for example, in, in my teaching on how to uh, teach critical theory to, you know, MSc health science dissertation students, for example. And it's, it's actually quite useful when thinking about creating a, a fictitious um, individual based on data that's um, gathered around from real stakeholders, identifying, you know, particular needs and priorities. So I'm not going to go through the entire list, but you can find out more from, from our book, the different types of methods to engage um, non-academic stakeholders, including uh, the design dash activity. Next slide, please, Andrew. Again, the third key idea really focuses on ethical considerations when working with um, particularly vulnerable groups or groups um, where you know, resources are difficult to, to access based on their social positions, for example. And in, in these chapters, we really highlight, again, you know, bioethics, understanding the ethical process, review boards, the notion of empathy when doing community engaged research, dealing with different ethical dilemmas, for example, working with people who perhaps can't provide consent themselves. Um, Wang highlights the responsabilitization of ethics, ethical considerations for um, technology and technology research and development in general and at large. Next slide, please, Andrew. And what's really great about the Engaged Researcher book is that we provide real case studies to kind of demonstrate how these methods have been useful um, when conducting research. So one case study is um, the NANA project. So co-creating novel assessment of nutrition and aging with older adults living at home. And this project is was actually really excellent in highlighting how you know, a team of people from different disciplines and as well as older people have co-created this tool to help kind of assess daily activities, nutrition, um, and so on and so forth. And it's actually generated several different projects um, and, and studies from this uh, particular case study. 
And yeah, so I'd like to then pass on to Alex for yep, the next section. Alex now who, yeah, Alex yep. is next up. Yep, but right. some questions to think about, Andrew, if you, if you go on to the next slide are, are highlighted. Thank you. Great, thanks, May. So uh, I'll take on the, the last section here. Andrew, next slide, please. And, and I'll get through this pretty quickly so we can get to some questions and, and comments and any discussion. So section four really is about creating research products, right? So in the area of technology and aging specifically, but really kind of in an area, any area of research, we all know that outcomes are paramount. You know, whether that's academic publications, whether that's patents, whether that is commercialization, knowledge translation, et cetera, we want to make sure that you know, we want to get our research results and outcomes into the hands of the people who really benefit the most. And that is, you know, the clients, the patients, the uh, participants that we're working with moving forward. So one thing we address in this book, though, is how to do that, because, you know, as you know, uh, you know, whether you're an academic or not, um, moving beyond our typical academic outcomes of publications can be a bit tricky. And so what we try to do in this section um, in order to tie everything together is really talk about some of the ways to do that itself. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of creating research products, um, it's really important to take a holistic approach when you're looking at this and particularly looking at different ways um, that we can be communicating about our work right to the point of commercializing themselves. So in this section itself, you're gonna see various factors that need to be considered um, in the development of these research products, specifically communicating effectively, which is in chapter 35, you know, needing to understand how to maneuver through the policy and regulatory landscape where a lot of new technologies get hung up. So we'll talk about that in chapter 39. Um, needing to understand the health system landscape. And again, this is a big issue that we always see um, you know, as we all know, Canada does not have one healthcare system, but has 10 different healthcare systems, and each one has different policies and regulatory landscapes that you need to understand. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the section as well. Finally, and probably most importantly, to tie this all together, you need to develop a strong knowledge mobilization plan, which is discussed in Chapter 47, uh, including the nuances of protecting your intellectual property, commercialization, et cetera which as well as is covered in chapters 42 and 45. Next slide, please. So in terms of a case study of how we pull this all together, uh, there's a product out there called Rate My Treads. And, and the project itself is knowledge and a, a knowledge being posted on a website. So Rate My Treads is a particular uh, nice research project and case study that ties a lot of the concepts I discussed on the previous slide all together because what they did is they did a combination of your typical academic exercise, um, some unique communication processes, and then a, a very strong knowledge mobilization plan in order to get the information out. So Rate My Treads started as a research project at Toronto Rehab where they tested various types of footwear uh, to see how well they perform on icy conditions uh, to help people be more informed when they go out and buy their winter boots. So they conducted the research, they gathered all the data. They then did a very strong communication plan where they worked with the hospital and the university in order to really get the results out there beyond their journal papers. So that is in the media, uh, social media, et cetera. And then from that, they launched a website where basically they posted their information in a way that was consumable by um, you know, your typical everyday person. And so it wasn't, uh, you know, academic data that was being posted, but were rating systems of the boosts that they, that they tested themselves. So through the combination of all these approaches and their knowledge mobilization plan, in the first, I think like three months, they had some like 2 million hits to their website. And in fact, the boot last year that was rated number one on their website was the top boot uh, seller during the, the holiday seasons as well. So right there, if you want some evidence on how this uh, process works, I think that's some of the best one you can see. Next slide, please. 
So to finish up there, just some questions to think about, obviously, in your own research projects. First and foremost, what kind of product are you developing? Going back to Andrew's opening slides, you know, there's more than one different type of product. It's not just about the technology itself. How are you trying to help and support, uh, you know, in, throughout your research in terms of the work that you're doing? What is the best way to get to that audience, obviously, in the, the consumer uh, group that you're actually looking at? And finally, you must consider what is your knowledge mobilization plan? Is it effective? Is it feasible? And with that, I'll hand it back to Andrew. Thanks, Alex. Um, great. So um, I think we've uh, covered a lot of stuff uh, today um, in, in quite a lot of detail, to be honest. But I think we've got some time for uh, questions and answers. Um, So uh, um, do we have any uh, questions and answers? Any questions from the, from the audience? We're more than happy to, uh, to, to answer those. Andrew, it looked like Pam had her hand up. Oh, right. I'm not seeing that, to be honest. Um, Andrew, uh, it's Dorina here. Do you want to announce perhaps the winners of the, of the book? I just sent it to you in, in the chat. And, and then maybe while you're doing that, folks can think about some questions okay, to ask. Okay. Yeah, hang on. I'm going to find the chat again. There we go. OK, so uh, we have. Um, Winners of the book draw uh, competition. I'm going to make life easier and I'm going to announce that. So we've got through three books that we're going to give away today. So, um, uh, so we have a drum roll here. Uh, the winners of today's book draw are firstly from our older adults and caregiver advisory committee, uh, Chaitali Desai. Um, so uh, that's great. And secondly, um, the champion tweeter to today is uh, Hector Perez from the University of Waterloo. So um, a book, uh, the uh, hard copy of the book will be on its way to you, Hector. And thirdly, um, Selena Alou from the University of Calgary. Calgary. Uh, Juliet will be in touch with about mailing copies uh, to, um, to everybody who was uh, who, who's won one. So uh, congratulations. It's well, it's well worth the wait. Okay. Uh, Great, Andrew, thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat asking, how did you all go about working together on this book? That's a really good question. Um, can, can, I, can I answer that one? Um, so in a kind of a way, we, we work together by having a common framework that we could work together um, so that everybody um, knew what their, what their role was in, in, in terms of uh, pr producing their, di their different chapters. Um, so what, what, we, what we evolved over time was a, was a very, very basic framework for each of the, those chapters. Uh, which was to highlight the challenge that that people were were addressing. Uh, what are the key ideas in addressing that challenge? And then this idea of the product innovation pathway. So having that kind of common framework was very useful for people to to work within it. And it, I think it was very flexible as well. You know, this wasn't about constraining people's ideas, uh, but really to um, allow people to uh, work very effectively. Uh, in, in putting their, their ideas into, um, in, into a form that would fit into this book. And it was quite a big task to get, I think, uh, I can't remember what the figures were that we had before, 67 authors uh, in total and 49 different chapters, um, which, uh, and which was a, a, a very big uh, task to put together, I can, I, I can assure you. But I was really impressed 
in the way that a very diverse community can work together effectively to, to, produce, uh, to produce this. Maybe uh, do, do any of my colleagues like to comment on that? Yeah, Andrew, I'd just like to uh, add that we had quite um, strong leadership from yourself um, and a lot of uh, meetings about, you know, what did we want the direction of the book to be? We, we really developed um, a shared understanding about who the book was aimed at and, and, and what was it for and how, we, how was it going to help researchers? And I think, I think that was really important that we, we talked through those issues together, not just at the start of the book, but um, as the book developed. Um, to ensure that we, you know, kind of that the, the ethos of the book was clear and continued um, all the way through. And I thought that was a really important uh, part of it, especially when we were introducing new ideas like the case studies. And the book has a series of learning activities as well. Um, so that, you know, we built those in as the book progressed um, because of that um, developing notion of what the book was about and who it was there to support. So I think that was uh, that was important, the communication and the uh, reflexive attitude that we had with each other. Yeah, and um, it's me here. I'm just thinking about, you know, with any great idea, I think it starts off in, in coffee shops. So I do remember that. I do remember chatting away um, and yeah, us just still talking about how Agewell can um, produce an output that really highlights all the unique projects of Agewell from, you know, and, and kind of demonstrate how we can work in transdisciplinary ways um, and how we can get products from, you know, an idea onto the market. So I, I think that's, that's quite an, an important point to highlight as well. Thanks, May. What one of, one of the things that I I found valuable was the amount of stuff that I actually learned in all this in all this process. You know, and I think I think it highlights the 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 importance of a transdisciplinary perspective. Is that the certain things that you know I I know um, and, and have a reasonable degree of expertise in, and then there was certain areas where. I have very little expertise and knowledge in, and um, and you know going back to my own research, and I've, I've always felt that um, I could have done better in terms of turning the research that I've been involved in into into real world products and and, and services. Um, to some extent, I've been successful in doing that, but I think overall. Um, we, we could all as researchers do better in, in, in that respect. And I don't think it's beyond the, the scope of researchers to, um, to, to, to think about that, or at least put in place things that are gonna help that process along right from, from the start. So that was the, the, one of the big learnings that I had uh, from, from all this. Do we have any, uh, any more questions? Hang on. I think that's uh, about it, Andrew. You've got to th thank you, and uh, All right. people are looking um, forward to the publication being uh, uh, useful and co collaborative. And okay. uh, folks are asking whether you'll be, all of you will be available to sign copies of the, of the book. I'm, I'm, I'm sure more than happy to sign copies of this. Uh, so um, we need to wind, wind things up now. So um, just to highlight that. Uh, we have another uh, webinar coming up on March the 18th, which is going to be, um, you know, I can't see exactly, uh, Andrea Wilkinson, uh, founder of Brain Shape, and Frank Nofo uh, at Bruyere University, um, who are going to be talking about keeping your brain active and healthy during COVID-19. So that's a really um, valuable thing to be thinking about. I really encourage you all to fill out our five-minute evaluation uh, survey, um, if you can do that. And thank you very much um, for joining us today. Thank you to my co-editors. Thanks very much, everyone.